Thank you. It's a great pleasure uh, to be here, a great honor as well. Uh, I want to congratulate the uh, organizers and the managers of this amazing uh, project. Uh, and thank you all for attending this uh, meeting uh, uh, tonight. Uh, it's a very depressing topic, as you may imagine. What are the chances for peace uh, in Israel and Palestine? Uh, it is even more depressing if you remember, if I remember correctly, that I have been giving talks under this title in the last 40 years, which means the chances have not improved, probably. Otherwise, there would be a different title to this talk. But I think it is important. It is very, very important to discuss uh, Palestine and the future of Palestine, uh, especially in a moment where, due to uh, the uh, developments around Palestine, especially in Syria and Iraq, there is a tendency to push the issue of Palestine to the margins of uh, public attention, uh, which also reflects the, the lack of interest among uh, politicians and uh, diplomats in the future of Palestine. Whereas uh, 10 years ago, you could have said it was still a very important uh, topic uh, very high on the agenda of uh, policy makers, of major uh, actors in the international uh, arena, uh, today it is less, becomes less and less crucial in their eyes uh, to do anything about Palestine. And it seems that also the uh, traditional triggers that used to attract international attention to the need to help and solve the question of Palestine, such as an uprising uh, or uh, uh, a deterioration in the conditions uh, uh, of living uh, of the Palestinians, it seems that these triggers do not work anymore because everything is compared to what's happening in Syria. Uh, and you cannot really win in this comparison. Uh, the, the level of destruction in Syria, which of course includes also the destruction of Palestinian life there, uh, is such that it's very difficult to um, uh, insist that first the Palestine issue is strongly connected to the events in Syria and even to peace in Syria, and secondly that the atrocities in Palestine have not started three or four years ago but have been going on for a century and therefore uh, they may not seem always as dramatic and as cruel and brutal as they do seem today in uh, Syria. Uh, uh, the world still needs to remember what happened in Palestine, what goes on in Palestine, and should definitely not forsake uh, the Palestinians and their homeland. So it's obvious that the, the first answer to the question of the chances of peace is connected to uh, developments outside of Palestine. It is quite logical to say that uh, if there will be any positive movement uh, in Syria and in a certain, in a certain respect also in Iraq, then uh, the world attention would be redirected, uh, hopefully, to Palestine once more, and that always gives a, a better chance. But uh, this is, I think, only one trigger that can enhance the chances of peace and reconciliation. And I don't think it is the most important one, uh, because uh, uh, whatever happens in Syria, uh, uh, I think that the events in Palestine have their own momentum and their own relevance to the future of the Middle East as a whole, and maybe even to the future of the relationship between the Arab and Muslim world and the rest of the world, no less than the events in Syria. And I think that's why uh, we are able as human beings, as activists, as politicians and journalists who are involved in these issues, I think we're able to to work parallel on parallel lines here with or with more than one uh, case of injustice 
that calls uh, uh, on our uh, consciousness or our attention. And uh, there are more important elements which are missing, I think, and I would like to highlight them tonight, uh, which for me are the main obstacle for peace. And uh, they are not all related to the kind of usual uh, suspects, if you want. Uh, most people would say, well, you need to see a change in American policy if you want to see any chance for reconciliation in Israel and Palestine. Uh, other people would say you need uh, the Palestinian issue of unity to be resolved. You need a more united Palestinian front. You need a more authentic Palestinian representation uh, in order to move or to enhance the chances of peace. And I think both issues are uh, 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 correct, both the issue of uh, uh, American policy and the need for Palestinian unity. But I think there are even deeper concerns that are, should really interest us when uh, we are analyzing the chances for peace in Israel and Palestine. And they are not less relevant than American policy or Palestinian unity, which again, I want to stress, I'm not underestimating the importance of these two uh, elements. And the, uh, what I mean by that is, the, is really the role that Europe needs to play, and Britain maybe in particular needs to play in the story uh, of Palestine, both as a historical narrative, as a current problem, and as a future vision. If you uh, look at the way the issue of Palestine is engaged with in Western universities, for instance, or how European and British media uh, frame the question of Palestine. Or if you listen to the BBC or view the BBC whenever it uh, does its uh, utmost uh, to relate to Palestine in a deeper way, namely not just as an item of news, but through documentaries, in-depth uh, analyses, and so on, there is one striking feature that I think is an obstacle for peace in that kind of a treatment. And I'm just talking about the BBC as a symptom of a much wider phenomenon, which reflects the way politicians in Europe frame the issue in Palestine, the way the media in general does, and the academia and other cultural uh, uh, spaces uh, or agencies when they deal with, with Palestine. And what is striking is the inability of all those who have a say uh, in their local societies or have an impact in the local society or potential impact in their local societies about the future of Palestine is their inability to define Zionism the ideology behind the Jewish state as colonialism. As if this is the worst thing you can say about uh, an ideology of a state. There are so many societies around the world that uh, have come to terms with their colonialist past, either as colonizers or as colonized. There are so many societies who understand that their colonialist past, and again, depends which role they played in it, is uh, a, a very good ex explanation for their predicament uh, in the present. Uh, some deal with it successfully, some deal with it less successfully, but rarely does any one of these societies who was within the colonialist condition, rarely do they uh, uh, deny the fact that they were part of a colonialist reality. Uh, Zionism was such a clear case study of settler colonialism, that it must have been an amazing Israeli success to convince Western academia, Western media, Western political system to totally ignore that fact. There isn't one course in a university or a module in the West on colonialism that uses Zionism as a case study. 
There isn't one encyclopedia in the world that under the entry of colonialism would mention Zionism. This is such a fabrication of history that if you understand its power, you will understand also why it is so significant, no less than American policy and no less than the lack of unity on the Palestinian side. This is highly important. The fact that the colonialist project was able to present itself as something which was exactly the opposite, uh, as actually a victim of colonization, rather than the colonial power itself, explains a lot of the exceptionalism, the immunity that it won throughout the years for its project in Palestine. And the peace process had totally ignored this historical fact. And by ignoring the historical fact, it allowed the colonization to deepen, to go further, to such an extent that, of course, it's even more difficult to decolonize Palestine today than it was 50 years ago or 70 years ago. I can't think of another peace process in the world which had no relevance whatsoever to the problem as the Israeli-Palestinian peace process. So many people owe their careers to this process, including uh, the illustrious Tony Blair. <laughs> so, many, um, so many academics have reached the highest possible echelons in British academia because of the peace process. So many publishers made money out of books written uh, on, on the peace process. And so many hopes were shattered by this peace process. It is not surprising that when you visit Palestinians, wherever they are, whether it's inside Israel, the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, and refugee camps, they are the only group in the world that will tell you that whenever there was a peace process, life became worse. Life after the United Nations petition plan for Palestinians was much worse than it was a year before. Life after the Oslo process was far worse for Palestinians than it was a year before. There isn't such a place in the world where the peace process deteriorates the life of the people supposedly who should benefit from this process. And the reason, I come back to my point, the reason that this is happening is not because bad people are involved in the peace process. And not because everybody who is part of the peace process has bad intentions or cynical interests. Of course, some do. But quite a lot of good people were involved in the peace process throughout the years. But because the framing of the conflict was wrong, it ignored the main issue at hand, it became a waste of energy, of effort, but far worse, it became a tool in the hand of the settler colonial society to continue successfully the project of the colonization of Palestine and the dispossession of its people. So when people say the Oslo Accord was a failure, I disagree with them. From an Israeli point of view, the Oslo Accord was a huge success. It fragmented the Palestinian further. It... Uh, convinced Europe to finance the Israeli occupation, which was very costly before Oslo. And it provided Israel another 30 years of immunity from any international condemnation. So from an Israeli perspective, it was a great success. From a Palestinian perspective, it was a disaster which is no less significant than the disaster of 1948. But unless, unlike 1948, their own leadership signed that disaster themselves. And that's a big difference between the two points of disaster. So framing the conflict in, uh, or the issue of what's going on there, in the right way is a necessary step towards the future. Now most people who are activists and definitely people who live uh, under occupation and colonization would feel that this, they don't have the patience or the time 
for such a process to mature. Understandably, they would like to see immediate results, an immediate end to their suffering. And they would say, it would take too long for you to convince people to use the right language, to frame correctly uh, what was uh, misframed, if you want, in the last 30, if not the last 70 years. But unfortunately, sometimes there are no shortcuts in history. Sometimes you have to do the long, to take the long journey, even if you wasted 40, 50 years of not going in the right direction. And I'm not saying again that this is the only missing uh, element. I mentioned again, and I will mention it again, the American policy, Palestinian unity, and maybe other elements that some of you would probably bring up in the Q&A session. But all of it will not work if we will not begin to use the right language when we speak about the past in Palestine and when we speak about the present and the future. So one important uh, element in the new language is, of course, the word colonialism. And one can see how the Israelis successfully convince people that this is an anachronism. Who can talk in 2015 about colonialism? This is something associated in the minds of people with 19th century uh, British imperial policies, French policies, and maybe even more ancient policies of the Spain, uh, Spain and, and Portugal, Holland and Belgium, and so on. But the reality is that, uh, uh, and thanks to very uh, acumen scholarship, we now understand that there were two kinds of colonialisms. One which is really an anachronistic one, namely, if you describe someone as a colonialist today, you may miss uh, define, okay, or not define correctly uh, what you're looking at. But if you define certain societies today in the world as settler colonial societies, not as colonialist societies, as settler colonial societies, you get much closer to an accurate description of not only the past in Palestine, and not only the present in Palestine, but unfortunately also the future in Palestine. The difference between colonialism and settler colonialism is that settlers who came to North America, to Latin America, to Australia, to New Zealand, to the southern tip of Africa, and to Palestine, were not sent there by their empires. There were people who were running away from something. Some of them were running away from religious persecution. Others uh, were seeking better economic life. Others felt unsafe for, what, for personal reasons. It doesn't matter. But what really combines all of them as an historical phenomenon is the fact that they were looking, if you want, in today's traveler's uh, language, they were buying one-way ticket. They had no intention of going back. And they were not only looking for a home, they were looking for a homeland. And they all encountered the same problem. The homeland that they chose as a safe refuge, usually, was inhabited by someone else. In most cases, they did not hesitate and genocided the natives in order to make the space their own. Quite often, expropriating their history of these people as their own. Uh, sometimes leaving the names of the places. Uh, very few have gone as far as the Americans to call their weapons of mass destruction the names of the Native American tribes that they have destroyed. Uh, but others went uh, uh, nearly as far as the white settlers of uh, North America. Uh, where, un unfortunately, the settler colonial project was successful, namely, the indigenous people were annihilated. In many ways, the settler colonial societies today feel quite comfortable to confess about the genocide, to come to terms with that history, because the price is not very high. 
the price is maybe a different textbook. The price may be a different uh, memorial calendar, maybe a museum that wasn't there before, and this is not undermining what you're doing here. The price, as we know from South Africa, of actually settler colonial projects which did not destroy fully the native people was political solution that a built of redistribution of resources, of sharing rule, the rule, the sovereignty, on finding political and cultural and economic processes which would allow the natives to get back their normal life that were denied to them by the settler colonial project. And if you accept this, you can see another great Israeli success, apart from the fact that the peace process would never deal with Zionism as colonialism. The other side of the coin is dealing with Palestinian resistance to colonialism as terrorism. To this very day, every Palestinian stabbing is regarded as terrorism. Immediately it is, and wrongly, one should say, it's immediately compared to the acts of uh, uh, the Islamic State uh, and Al-Qaeda in Europe. And there's no connection. But, of course, the Israelis would like you to think that this is the same phenomenon of a uh, uh, new kind of uh, political Islam that sends individuals to suicide missions uh, in the name of Islam to hurt the Western civilization. This is not what's happening in Jerusalem or in Haifa. This is not the same. It's a very different context. Unfortunately, some of the Islamic movement themselves are not paying enough attention to the difference between what's happening in Palestine and what's happening uh, in Europe. It's not the same at all. This is part of a long anti-colonialist struggle, a legitimate, moral, anti-colonialist struggle that began from the moment Palestinians, either as individuals or as collective, understood the real nature of the settler colonialist project of Zionism. Of course you resist by force sometimes, as a last resort mainly, settler colonialism. Those of you who are familiar with the uh, U uh, Universal Declaration of the Indigenous People, published in 1984, would know that the main body of this declaration of, of a, a kind of a united body of people who were victims of settler colonialism around the world is a demand to recognize their right for an armed struggle as a last resort and, and insisting that the international community would include it in a legitimate self-defense as it does in the United Nations Charter when it relates to the right of nations to defend themselves against an outside aggressor. Of course, unfortunately, the international community did not accept it, neither in the case of the Tamils in, uh, uh, in Southeast Asia, uh, uh, in the case of the FLN in Algeria, the ANC uh, in, in, in South Africa. But that doesn't mean that they don't have a, a very valid point when they talk about themselves as self-defense, people who are, in, uh, are involved in self-defense and not people who are involved in terrorism for the sake of terrorism, which is another great, as I say, Israeli uh, 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 success in framing differently the reality from what uh, uh, it was. So we need to take the two sides of the correct and accurate framing of the reality in Palestine. The settler colonial project of Zionism on the one hand and the anti-colonial struggle of the Palestinians on the other. That doesn't mean that you cannot criticize the means by which you resist colonialism. That doesn't mean that in 2015 you should not seek for non-violent methodology in order to undermine the project of settler colonialism. But that means that as an international community, you should understand the nature of the struggle and therefore uh, the nature of the peace process. 
because the one is the, an outgrowth of the other. I would like to attract your attention more specifically to the idea of partition in this context. And I hope someone is taking care of the time frame because uh, if you don't stop me, we'll have breakfast here together. <laughs> okay. So give me some indication. At the very heart of the so-called peace process in Palestine, since it began earnestly after 1967, uh, and it even produced, as you know, some Nobel Peace Prize as well. I mean, it was really regarded as one of uh, uh, the most enlightened part of Western civilization, the, the effort to build peace in Palestine on the basis of partition. At the heart of this process is the, the idea of the partition. It first was offered by the Zionist movement to Britain, when Britain was still a mandatory power, in 1937. As you know, uh, British policy between 1918 to 1937 was based on the assumption that both the settlers and the natives would be happy to bask under the imperial sun forever. Uh, which is kind of a notion Britain had about many other uh, people around the world, until they found out that, surprisingly, although everybody loved British theatre and literature and so on, they wanted independent from, from Britain, even the Indians. <laughs> so, when the realization came that uh, Britain would not be able to hold Palestine forever, and the Palestinians had revolted against the British uh, rule in Palestine and its pro-Zionist policy in between 1936 to 1939. Uh, the government in London was looking desperately for a way out of it. And they didn't have their own ideas, one should say. Uh, the Zionist movement was always very clever. And settler colonialist movements are very clever. They have to be very clever because they need to convince everyone that something that never belonged to them is theirs. So they have to be alert all the time. They need to have a ready-made history, a ready-made claim. The native people will never, are never able to confront it properly because they don't know how to answer the question, what are we doing here? But the Zionists always knew the answer to the question, what are we doing here? So they were also always very alert to the problems in Britain in formulating an idea for a solution. So in 37, given the fact that the Jewish community in Palestine, of, especially the settler community of Palestine, was only one third of the population, they suggested to Britain that the best idea for a solution is to partition Palestine. And they were even presented themselves as a modest group of people. They said, we, we just want one third of the country. Uh, because we are one-third of the population. Uh, and they also suggested that the rest of Palestine would actually be annexed to the new kingdom that the British have founded in Jordan. And uh, they found a way of inserting their ideas into a British inquiry commission, the Peel Commission, that suggested the partitioning uh, uh, of Palestine. The same idea with a different kind of division of the geography came in 1947. Again, this time it was not Britain. It was the United Nations, a very young international organization with no idea whatsoever how to solve international conflict. They haven't improved since then, one should say. But at least one can forgive them their uh, problems in the first three years, uh, the teething problem that they had. And Palestine was the real problem that they had to face. They had no idea how to solve the, the issue of Palestine. They sent a delegation under the name of UNSCOP, the United mm -hmm. Nations Special Committee of Palestine, of people who have never been not only to Palestine, have never been to the Middle East. And they came uh, and, and they were lost for ideas. Uh, the Palestinians and the Arab states, anyway, boycotted the United Nations uh, Committee. So the only people they were negotiating with were the, the leaders of the Zionist movement. 
And not surprisingly, the Zionist movement said to them, we have a brilliant idea for a solution. We should petition Palestine. It was very interesting that the Zionist movement in 1947 felt so secure that it actually suggested that 80% of Palestine should be a Jewish state. The people who came from Honduras and Canada and Australia felt, you know, from kind of a Western logical perspective that even, even they understood that this was a bit too much. And they, they went with the idea of parity. They said 50-50 more or less is, is a reasonable idea. What is interesting is what happened to us in the international community since 1947. We regarded the idea of partition as a very fair, just solution. And the moment the Palestinians rejected the partition, they were immediately framed as unreasonable, primitive people who are an obstacle for the uh, advance of uh, modernization and civilization in Palestine. This was a clever ploy of the Zionist movement, I must say. You really you have to give it to them. They, 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 they come to someone's homeland with this fabricated idea that they used to live there 2,000 years before. And because of that, they, they have a right at least to half of the place. And anyone who rejects it is the irrational person, is the primitive person. Whereas, actually, the hallucination is this idea that I can knock on someone's door in Bristol and say, excuse me, I used to live here 2,000 years ago. Please give me two of your rooms. And the next day, I come with a local policeman, and the local policeman says to him, you know, uh, here he is, he has the Bible. He's right. Bristol was his 2,000 years ago. Why, why are you not giving you half of the building? That this at all played a, a logical role um, among uh, policymakers is, is, is fascinating, but tragic at the same time. And um, this was something that uh, was built into the peace process later on. That if you do not agree to a partition, then you don't understand the essence of the conflict, and you are not working for peace in Palestine. Because what Partition did, as an idea, it claimed almost immediately that you have two national movements with equal right to the place. Not a settler colonial project that is trying to get rid of the natives, and definitely after three, three generations of settlers has to reconcile with the natives and find, like in South Africa, a way of living together. That was not at all the direction of the, of the peace process. The direction of the peace process was the just solution of partition. As if native people in the right mind would agree that the best way forward is to give up 50 or 60 or 70 percent of their homeland for the sake of peace. It is not surprising that certain Palestinian leaders and diplomats and so on eventually internalized this discourse, you only have to read Franz Fanon to understand that colonized people unfortunately do this. After a long time of colonization, you begin to internalize the logic, the perception, and the language of the colonizer. And you start talking about partition as if this is what the Palestinian national movement was all about. And you start to regard it as the absolute project of liberation. Of course, history has a way of coming back to you when you do mistakes. We make mistakes like this. And the reality in Palestine today is a, is a painful uh, reminder of what happens if you internalize the colonialists' uh, perception. Uh, if you read Albert Mami, a wonderful book called The Colonizer and the Colonized. It was written many years ago. But you would think that this is someone who just visiting Palestine today and reports to you the PA's behavior, the Hamas behavior, the behavior of the Palestinian leaders inside Israel. You, you won't believe that this book was written more than 45 years ago. Because Albert Mami understood very much the dynamics between colonizers and colonized. 
It's not black and white. It's not simple. There is a certain way in which the colonizer forces you to seek survival by being very harsh and very cruel that genuinely you cannot blame the colonized when survival becomes more important than a solution. And that's what Israel is banking on. That the more the destruction would, the more it deepens the destruction, the more the Palestinian would internalize the Zionist logic that Palestinian presence in Palestine is a concession the Zionist movement is willing to give to the native people. And Israel will define which percentage of the, on which percentage of the land they can live and how can they live on that percentage. That this is a colonizer's dream or vision is not surprising. What is surprising is that the international community framed this Zionist vision as a peace plan. And some of the most intelligent people in the world, some of the best politicians that the West and Europe has to offer, are talking with this logic as if this is the only way forward. They would brush aside anyone who would talk about decolonization, a one-state solution, equal rights to everyone, as best as a hallucinator, as worst as someone who wants to destroy the state of Israel. Even some of the best friends of the Palestinians, like Norman Finkelstein and Noam Chomsky, have internalized this logic in a way which is very surprising for people who are so sensitive, so bright, such intellectual towers. It shows you how successful this project of misframing, as I call it, has been. And I'm not talking about the Palestinians, again, who, who internalize this, this as well. Now let me finish by saying that uh, I'm not a naive person. I understand that uh, deprogramming or deconstructing this language is, is a huge, uh, almost impossible mission. But that doesn't mean that we have any other alternative. We, we really don't. And uh, I think that there is a movement. There is a movement. There is a change in this direction. And it's very encouraging on the one hand, and it's also very precarious on the other. Maybe it's natural that the political elites, wherever they are, whether it's the United States, whether it's in Russia or China or Europe or in the Middle East itself, maybe it's not surprising that the political elites themselves will never come up with a new idea. The power of inertia uh, is, is the DNA of a politician. It's, it's, uh, it's to keep you in the place you are. Rattling the boat uh, can lead you uh, into big trouble as Mr. Corbyn has learned in the last few weeks, among others. You can't really rattle the boat as a, as a political leader from above. It's, it's, it's impossible, unless, unless there is such a catastrophe that people you know, are willing to, to build something new from the ruins. But basically, if the catastrophe is not felt by everyone and is not realized by everyone, it's very difficult by words to present fundamental alternative to the policies that are in place. There isn't one example in history where it happened without a dramatic revolution. Now, so it's not coming from the politicians. So the movement is not there. Namely, if you go with me on a trip and we'll talk to every foreign minister in the world, including those who are regarded as Palestine's best friends in Pretoria, uh, in Caracas, in Venezuela, I don't know, whoever, they will uh, politely say to you, um, it's very interesting that you have new ideas, but we should stick to the two-state solution. The PA is for the two-state solution, the Hamas is for the two-state solution. Um, you know, it's, it's around the corner, so why, why try something new? You can tell them that you think that the corner that they're talking about is not on earth, but that won't 
never would convince a politician to look elsewhere. So it's not coming from the political elite, but it comes from two very important groups. One is the political activists, who long before anyone else, I think, understood that uh, their own politicians, their own media, and their own academics were not framing in the right way the reality in Palestine. And it began by students, for instance, in universities who decided to uh, organize in a focused way the struggle for Palestine within the Israeli apartheid week. Now, when you call Israel an apartheid state, it doesn't mean you did the proper scholarly research to find out whether really the two systems are the same. Uh, it doesn't even mean that you are happy with post-apartheid South Africa. It means, more importantly than anything else, that you are looking at the Zionist movement as a settler colonial movement that is using means which are very common among settler colonial movements. If they don't genocide people, they segregate them, they dispossess them, they ethnically cleanse them. There isn't one settler community who said to the natives, let's build a democracy together. There isn't such a case study. What can you do? There isn't. Zionism included. So when you call it the Israel apartheid week, it means that you have a very different perspective on what the conflict is all about and what is the way forward. And if you adopt the same tactics used by the solidarity movement with the ANC against the state of Israel, the BDS, the boycott, the investment sanctions. It means, again, that not only that you found something that you think can be very useful and effective, in fact, it's not yet effective at all. As you know, the BDS has not changed a bit any reality on the ground. The occupation is worse every day. The colonization is worse. The BDS did not succeed in, in changing the reality. But that's not what is important about the BDS. What is important about the BDS is, again, it conveys the message that the activists are not analyzing the reality in Palestine in the past, in the present, and in the future the same way as the political elites do, the same way as the diplomats do, the same way as the mainstream media does. And that's what's so important about talking about boycott, divestment, and sanctions. Of course, hopefully it will be also effective. We have to give it time. It's, it's a young movement, and we may see the results on the ground. We don't for the time being, but it may work. It may work. Uh, but it, it, for the time being, it's important because it's, it's a new language. It really is a new language. Not surprisingly, the Palestinian Authority, until very recently, was very much against the BDS because they understood that this is a different language, which really undermines the whole idea of Oslo, and partition, because the BDS includes all the Palestinians, all over Palestine, as a group of people that deserves the solidarity and sympathy and activism of people around the world. The second group that is moving, and which is very exciting, I think, and again, it doesn't have yet any impact on the ground, but we hope it will be, are the academics which is quite surprising. <coughs> Talking as an academic, I can tell you that uh, academics and change or courage is, is a rare combination. Uh, but in the case of Palestine, they have, in the last few years, adopted the settler colonial paradigm for Palestine, insisting, not all of them, of course, but quite a few and important academics insisted to rewrite the history of Palestine, to rewrite the political analysis of the reality in Palestine uh, from the settler colonialist uh, perspective. And it's not surprising when we organize a, a conference on settler colonialism at the University of Exeter, uh, the uh, pro Israeli uh, forces in this country did all they could to uh, try and stop a very marginal, small conference we had in Exeter. They, they, they understood fully and rightly from their perspective what is the significance on a conference that is academic, purely academic, sanctioned by the university, 
and is willing to apply the paradigm of settler colonialism to Israel. The Board of Deputies describe it as something which is akin to uh, a meeting of Nazis. Uh, another Jewish group said that this is anti-Semitism of the worst kind. They don't know what settler colonialism is, by the way, but they heard the word colonialism, and that trigger in their mind something which I think they always knew, especially the Anglo-Jewish community, always knew that their unconditional support for Israel is a conditional support for a human project that anywhere else in the world would never receive their support. They would never support apartheid in South Africa. They would never support oppression in Argentina and Chile. They would never support genociding people elsewhere in the world. And yet, when it comes to Israel, they forget all these very important moral precepts that uh, direct their uh, point of view. So when academia says, professionally, we are dealing with this, this is, is this mine? Oh my God. I don't think so. I think yes. Oh my God. <laughs> Turn it off. Do you have I've, I've, there's two. I've <laughs> okay. Turn it off? Yeah, yeah, turn it off. Turn it off. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Um, this is something that uh, is, you can understand the fear from such a turn in the language, in the, in the, uh, the framing, if you want. The conference, by the way, eventually took place. Uh, and I think this will eventually lead, and this is where I start and this is where I will end, this will lead to the inclusion of the um, Palestine as a case study in courses on colonialism, in textbooks on colonialism, maybe in encyclopedias on colonialism, or in col the entry on colonialism and so on. Uh, and maybe this kind of joint effort from below, by academics, by activists, would begin to change the way the reality is framed, from here at least. Again, this cannot by itself, of course, change the reality on the ground. Palestinian unity, American policy, uh, struggle from within the progressive Jewish community inside Israel are all very important. But I think that they, are all, they need a cement, they need something to, to keep them together. And that kind of cement is in the power of, the, of the, the pen, not the power of the sword. As the famous adage says, sometimes the pen is mightier uh, than the sword. And I think that uh, we should uh, do our best where we can change, uh, because there are some areas that we are unable to change things. So I think I'll stop here, uh, see whether it's an urgent call, and then uh, answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.